what is energy? In Western science, we have very specific definitions of energy, of things that we can easily measure. And then in healing, we have terms for energy from many different cultures and other perspectives, some of which are not easy to measure. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the field, the aspect of energy, and what do we mean, and, and what can we learn by putting these different perspectives together into one, one system, one model. When we look at energy on a level of physics in a biological system, uh, we can look at the, in science, the Nernst equation defines the energy for us in a liquid system, in a biological fluid, such as in the body. And there are three factors. There's essentially the, the ability of that fluid to conduct electricity, the conductivity or resistivity of the fluid. I interpret that as the presence of light energy in the fluid. Why? Because when you have a chemical compound that's, that's, that has no electrical charge, it, such as most organic molecules, it doesn't carry electricity in water. Right? It has no electrical charge in order to carry electricity if it moves, so, so it doesn't really interact so much with, with electricity. And so we say there's, on a physics level, that we don't, we're not measuring energy. There's another kind of energy, there's en other forms, and we're gonna, you know, that's gonna be important too, the bonding energy and, 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 and other forms of energy in that organic substance can be, uh, but it's harder to measure on the level of the Nernst equation. Equation doesn't account for that, doesn't look at that. Uh, so that's gonna come in later. But if we, uh, if we create a charge, if we ionize, say uh, hydrogen off of that, maybe there's a carboxylic acid uh, uh, residue on that, on that organic molecule chain, and now a hydrogen ionizes. Now we've got a negative charge and a positive charge, and now we have two ions, and now, now it's gonna carry, that fluid's gonna carry electricity. So the difference between the hydrogen being attached and, and being a non, charged molecule versus being ionized is a quantum of a measurable quantum of energy, electromagnetic energy that we can define as a, a photon, a, a quantum level of electromagnetic energy. So that's why I say that's a measure of light energy. And we can see this in the actual biocommunication testing process where there's instantaneous changes as the body responds to its energetic environment. There's these quantum changes that have cascading effects throughout the whole body. And so the body's always, it's a sensory system, it's a, it's a process, information processing system, it's a responsive system. You know, we've, we've come through uh, some decades of science, really, really tuned into the DNA, thinking, well, that's where the action is, that's the brain, that's, that's uh, what's determining how the cell will, uh, will act. And there's, there's an element of truth to that, but just like, just like there is in the brain, it's, is it your brain that determines how you act? Well, what if you close your eyes? What if you put earmuffs on and close your eyes, put on a big suit so you can't feel anything, see anything, hear anything? How good is your brain at acting? Well, it's gonna act according to its environment. But if you open your eyes and suddenly you see a train's coming at you at 100 miles an hour, you're gonna jump out of the way. So, so there's the sensory information, same at a cellular level. On the cell membrane, there are little antennae, there's receptors, there's, there's little windows of biocommunication, they're called rafts that have cholesterol and, and ceramides, and they can be in a state of openness, like our eyes taking in light, or a state that's closed to protect the cell from, from stress while the cell breaks down uh, any stressors that have come into the cell. So it's a dynamic system that responds to the environment just like our body level does with sensory, cognitive, and, process, and, and subconscious processing and reflex processing. There's all these levels of processing. So the DNA is like a brain in that sense. It, it responds to its environment like our brain responds to our senses. So, so there's the light energy, then there's 
there's electrical energy of the electron itself. And there's, and, and how do we measure that? Well, in, 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 uh, in medicine, there's a test called bioelectronics of Vinson that measures these three parameters of energy, the, the resistivity, which I take as a measure of the light and photonic energy. The, the electrical energy is measured by RH2. That, what is that? Hydrogen, molecular hydrogen potential. Why? Because if you have protons, like I talked about the proton going into solution when the ionize the carboxylic acid, the protons, when you take two protons, if you have electrons, you'll take two electrons and form a molecule of hydrogen, an H2 molecule, two atoms of hydrogen make a molecule. So the, what we can measure biologically in the fluid is the level of H2 with a, with a hydrogen electrode. And so that measures how much or how little electrons we have. And then for the third factor is the proton. So photon, electron, proton. We probably know that pH, potential hydrogen, or pH, it's the, the H plus the hydrogen atomic nucleus ion that you're measuring and potential, that potential hydrogen, pH. And so acidic is a low pH and that means a lot of protons. So those are our three measures for the conventional understanding of the biophysics of energy in a biological system. But wait, there's more. Why? Because there's the energy of the spirit and the consciousness that, uh, 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 that are a tremendous amount of energy, and yet they're not tremendously easy to measure. The one measurement of the amount of energy in one human spirit was Dr. McDougall's study that found at the instant of death there was equivalent of a couple Hiroshima bombs of energy that instantaneously left the body. And then over a course of up to over an hour, hour or two, there was another couple, potentially in some cases, uh, another couple of hydrogen bomb equivalents of energy that left the body. That's a huge amount of energy. Huge. And so it's not huge in terms of mass, but when it's in a different state of matter and in a state that's super conductive, so it doesn't lose energy, it only it gains energy with, with spiritual growth and, and, and a, he a healthy development of, of the body-mind-spirit complex. Uh, at, with coherence, that energy can have profound effects, not only locally, but non-locally in space-time as well. So that's the unmeasurable part. It's the dark matter and the dark energy. As, as from the conventional science point of view. We'll see it as dark matter and dark energy. So when, when we come from a holistic perspective, we're gonna see, we can describe it differently uh, because now there, we can see there actually are ways to measure. We can, we can observe the dark, what would be looked for as dark matter, but it's gonna be looked for in the wrong place by conventional science. Uh, in the wrong way. Uh, if we look from the, the perspective of the whole being, we're going to see that the spirit minerals are a type of dark matter. They're a type of dark matter that's here now, that matters, that's physiologically absolutely significant. It's, it's the holy grail. It's the vessel that holds the consciousness. Right? The living Consciousness is not a diffuse thing. It has a vessel, has a form. When we measure vision, for example, we measure a nonius heropter. It has a mathematical shape that has a center point. Whether we're a one-eyed person or a two-eyed person, in, in a one-eyed person, that shape will be centered on a point somewhere behind the eye. It's the point from which we project our vision of the world. For a two-eyed person that's working with the two eyes together, that point will be shifted toward the midline from the dominant eye, but it'll be on the side of the dominant eye. It won't be shifted, it'll be on, on the, shifted from the midline toward the dominant eye. Uh, you know, shifted from behind the dominant eye 
slightly toward the other eye because it's now taking in that perspective to a degree. So this particular point, and it can move, it's not, it's not centered on a biological structure at all. It's centered on a spiritual structure. And there is a structure, a mineral structure, to the spirit. It's just that that structure is super fluid. It can move in and out of the biological space in, in, in out-of-body experience, in out, in near-death experience. The, the spirit body is no longer anchored into the biology because the biology is is not working at the moment, so it has no reason to anchor in. So it finds another, it usually floats upward, it'll go to a corner of a room typically, and which, which it would be interesting to study which corner in terms of, not in terms of earth coordinates so much as galactic coordinates. There's evidence that there's a galactic orientation. For example, the studies on interpersonal communication where we have people separated and, and, and you're looking at stimuli and I'm trying to imagine what you're seeing. I can't see you, there's no way of conventional communication of the senses or, or uh, you know, cell phones or anything between us. And so there, it's, there's a certain protocol that's been done hundreds and hundreds of thousands of times. So there's lots and lots of data. And when they analyzed the data from all those studies together, what they found was there was actually one time of day, not in terms of our clock that, that has to do with the earth in relation to the sun, but if we make a clock that relates the earth, where you are on the earth, to where we are in the galaxy, the galactic center, when that's closest to the, the zenith, when, when, that's, when we're at sidereal noon, galactic noon, at galactic noon, oh, it's like, it's like uh, our interpersonal communication is on lunch break. It doesn't happen. It goes to zero. Every other time of day, there's crosstalk going on effectively from one person to another. And when the galaxy is saying, it's noon, everybody's going, it's, our spirits are going, it's noon. We're paying attention to that somehow and not to each other. So there's, there's evidence like that that's points to our orientation and likely the, the orientation of the pineal being uniquely in humans in, in an uh, internal uh, location in the center of the head where when the, the sutures close, fontanelles close, uh, you know, at a couple years old, there's no environmental light stimulus to this eyeball. The pineal is an eye. In, in other species, it's at the top of the head and uh, it receives actual environmental light input. So what is our pineal receiving? It's getting light signals from our eyes through the autonomic nervous system that regulate our diurnal, day-night, waking, sleeping cycles. It's the only, melatonin is, is the only hormone in the body that goes directly to every cell and goes to every nucleus of the cell. Most hormones go to certain cells and they have intracellular messengers. They stop at the cell membrane and, and send you know, another signal further in, but melatonin goes everywhere, talks to everybody, keeps us coherent and synchronized between different organs and systems. So uh, I suspect that the pineal may receive, be specialized in humans to be in the center of the skull in order to reduce that signal that in other species is the significant signal of environmental light in order to be, become more sensitive to some other signal, and that could be signals related to consciousness. I mean, the pineal has been called the seed of the soul for for decades, for for uh, hundreds of years. Uh, so, let's talk about a couple other cultures and what they see in relation to energy and consciousness. You know, the the. <coughs> The, uh, the Egyptians have a term noose for energy, for energy of consciousness. And the Egyptians had a very interesting reasoning that, that we're going to bring back into our thinking. Uh, that was that when you look at something, when you look at what's in front of you, 
in the direction you're going, you see it clearly, right? You don't see so clearly what's behind you, and that's where you're coming from, is what you don't see clearly. And, and so their unique reasoning was that if we look at time to see where we're coming from as spirits, as consciousness in time, they said when we look at the past, that's like looking at what's in front of us. We can see the past clearly. That's in front of us as spirit. And so where we're coming from must be the future. So it's, 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 a, it's a concept worthy of contemplation, I believe. That if who you are as a spirit is more now than who you were in the past, you're in the process of becoming the fullness of who you are as a transtemporal spirit, as a spirit beyond the question of past, present, and future. Who you are ultimately is who you're becoming. You're more now than you were when you were conceived, or when you were born, or when you were two years old. So you're developing who you ultimately become in the fullness of time, if you're an immortal being, who you become in the fullness of time is coherent with the fullness of what is. Yeah, yeah. it's a real loud one. Yeah. yeah. But you don't want to miss these parts. So. Yeah. Want to make? Who you're becoming is what I call your future self. And who you are as a spiritual being, because the spirit and the consciousness has this ability, what we call in physics non-locality. We see non-locality clearly at a quantum level. And the spirit and the mind act as a, as a quantum unit. You have one spirit, acts as one. And so, uh, When the plane came over, you were talking yes. about um, how what you can see ahead of you is the past, and what yes. was behind you is where you, you know, that, that. Yeah, I think I did that. Okay. Let's look at a couple other major civilizations. China and India. They see the body differently. They have different models. Let's see if we can use those two models, like using our two eyes to see space in more depth and more dimensionality. We're going to create a model we call the clinical theory of everything that accounts for those two perspectives of prana and chi, uh, well, chi and jing in, in the Chinese model. Uh, different aspects of energy and the, the dark, dark matter and dark energy, we could say, or energy and, and the material substance of the spirit. In, in, in Ayurveda, <clears throat> people who are using the term prana look at the body and they describe light. They're seeing the body. And so we have the chakra system, light emission from the body. In modern science, we have the work of Professor Fritz Popp measuring biophotons emitted by our cells and that these are coherent, like laser is coherent, they're coherent light emission, they're biocommunication, they're useful energy and they're useful signals that communicate between our cells within the body. Uh, qi in oriental medicine describes the meridians, the flow of energy in, in pathways like circuits in the body and so we have, we're viewing more of an electrical function versus a light function. And of course we have the material body, body of Western medicine that's more the protons, the matter. We want to measure the chemistry, what's your cholesterol level, 
how, how much cholesterol is in that plaque that's narrowing the artery, but, but not really looking at the chi, not looking at the electricity as much, and not <coughs> looking at the light energy function as much. <clears throat> but if we put all three views together, we can get a more comprehensive understanding of you and what's happening with you right now, because they're all important. The light energy of, of like the dark energy, the dark energy of science is the light energy of consciousness. Right? If you, uh, if you can, it's one thing if you can measure something with an instrument. We can measure uh, energetic effects at a distance of consciousness <clears throat> and of healing intention, and we can measure the effects in the body of increased healing with, with prayer studies. Uh, so we know there's a physical effect but it's a more subtle energy, so it's not as easy to measure. Uh, just like the material substance of the spirit body is a more subtle state of matter. It's a condensate, like a Bose-Einstein condensate, and so it's hard to measure, although the Russians did have a, create a patented uh, laboratory system for measuring the transition minerals in the condensate state. <clears throat> so there is information about it. We do know that the brain, for example, has 5% dry weight of M-state rhodium and iridium. That's a huge amount of uh, superconducting material that obviously <clears throat> has, has import, importance in the function of the, the, the link between the brain and the spirit and how consciousness carries information between the two in both directions because if your spirit has an intention such as in remote viewing and in remote healing we know now that there's that remote energetic effect that can be measured when there's an actual uh, information being received or being sent so we know with the function of the, the M state minerals that by their nature these condensates are only partially present here now and partly, on a, on a level of mass measurement, partly somewhere or some time else. That, and this is how that remote viewing and remote healing can take place, because the minerals of your spirit are bilocating. They're partly, they're five-ninths in your body here now. And so your conscious intent is, is seated in those. And it's transported through the wormhole connections so it's not having to be transmitted through space-time in a forward propagation manner where the energy would be diffused and couldn't possibly have an effect at 3,000 miles away and wouldn't be instantaneous. There'd be a delay uh, and couldn't transcend time. You wouldn't have uh, memories. You wouldn't have visions of the future. So. The, and that remote connection can travel at the speed of thought. So it's an entirely different function that's totally coherent with quantum physics in terms of the non-local function. It's just that the conventional quantum physics looks at it as an unknown, an unmeasurable, you know, it's inscrutable, therefore we're going to consider it as a, a probability field. It's, it's a, well, it could be, it, it could be anywhere in the universe, but we don't know. We're not going to model how it moves, how it changes, other than we observe from experiment that when we think about it, that's when it shows up there. Well, that's a clue. And, and it's not just inside the body, it's out. It's in the instrument. We created this instrument to watch light and see how it works, and now our intention is embodied in the instrument. It's there in space. That's our... Our, la our laser beam of consciousness crossing with the laser beam of creation and creating a quantum. Okay, so if we go back to, to the, the Chinese model with the meridians and the Indian model with the chakras, what is, is there a relationship was one of the questions that I began asking when <clears throat> first putting this, this bigger model together. How come we have these two different views? It's like we're looking into the same room through two different keyholes from different angles, different doors. It's like the old question of the elephant. What is the elephant? You have, you know, you have 
a whole room full of blind scientists describing the elephant. One says it's it's a rope hanging down from the ceiling because they're feeling the tail. And another one says no, it's like a, a it's a tube. It's it's like a hose. It's a big hose because they're feeling the trunk. And you know each one no, it's like a tree. It's feeling a leg. No, it's the wall. And they're feeling the the side of it. So we have these different perspectives, but if we put them all together, we can start to understand elephantness. And that's the point of the clinical theory. So the elephantness of, of the energetic body, the, the parts that are harder for Western science to measure, but are observable and are understandable, we've, we've got the light function, the electrical function. And, and so uh, I began asking, What's, what are the correlations? What are the relationships between these different functions? And how might that be related specifically to consciousness, to the development of the spirit? And so I looked at, at uh, in Oriental medicine, in the five element theory, uh, you know, five element theory grew out of the yin yang theory, which was a duality theory. But it's, it's, so it's a, a furthering of, of the understanding of how does that, that cycle of of yin material substance and yang energetic movement and change, how does how does that cycle play out in the in the forms you know of life or the forms in the world, and so the refinement came with the five element theory, and this is incredibly insightful observation. You know, the, the, consider a culture that five thousand years ago came up with these theories and came up with the observation of, of the meridians and the acupuncture points, which is still all accurate today. We can now, there's several ways that we can measure the acupuncture points. 